Hello, everybody. Hello. It's Kevin. And Brian. And we're here with episode 66 of The Horror Guys, where we're going to talk about some horror movies that we saw. What did we see? Four of them. Four of them? Four, Four movies. Big movies. Well, big? Yeah, they're movies. They're movies. Yeah. Well, this week we'll be discussing some more great modern and classic horror. We'll begin with a universal classic film, Behind the Mask. Sneak a peek at the nanny from 65. Take a dinner break with Omnivores from 2013. Mm, and finally have a silly laugh with Clown Fear from 2020. So, it's a lot to talk about. Here we go. Yeah. What did we see first? We saw a short film. We didn't see any short film. We didn't film. see a short film. Forget I said that. We saw Behind the Mask, a we universal did. classic. Yeah. Um, 1932. This wasn't really a horror movie. Yeah, it was at the time, probably. Uh, more of a thriller. I mean, spies and secret agents and, yeah, action and, yeah, not horror. It had a mad scientist with a bzz, bzz, bzz machine. Oh, yeah, there was that. Yeah, he did have the machine. Yeah, bzz, yeah, yeah. yeah and sparks and, bzz, and yeah. So, why don't you tell us about it? <sighs> Directed by John Francis Dillon. Written by Joe Swirling. Stars Jack Holt, Constance Cummings, and Boris Karloff. And he's not wearing monster makeup. No, he just himself. This is the year after Frankenstein. It was, I'll bet it was probably made before Frankenstein. Probably, yeah. 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 Hour and eight minutes. Link in the show notes to pick this one up. And well, part of my bias against this... We saw a horrible version. YouTube has it for free. Mm. And the lips started out out of sync and got worse and worse as it went on until it was many seconds out of sync. Some of our old podcasts are like that. Well, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was pretty bad. We, we should have just held out and waited for the DVD to show up. But we didn't, yeah. It kind of made my head hurt <laughs> trying to watch it. <laughs> it, it got I, I would have progressively been, worse as yeah, we went on. I, I would have enjoyed it more had we had a decent copy. But anyway, yeah. Well, two prisoners, Quinn and Henderson, talk about a plan. <clears throat> They're in prison. Henderson advises not trying to escape, but Quinn wants to break out today. And Quinn does get out. And Henderson is uh, Boris Karloff. Yeah. Yeah. And Quinn is the main character. Yeah. Meanwhile, at the U.S. Bureau of Investigation, is that a real thing? Used to be. Is that pre-FBI? Pre-FBI, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Arnold, Mr. Arnold, and another man talk about the government and a big dope bust. It seems one of the men, Arnold, is somehow involved in the drug dealings. Mr. Arnold's servant, Edwards overhears the whole conversation and reports it all to someone who has a voice recording machine. And that was fun, the old technology in this. They, One of those phones where you crank it and hold the little thing up to your ear? Mm -hmm. They had an answering machine for one of those. And, and there's uh, espionage where they're recording conversations, tapping the phone lines, and yeah, the, the tech was... was it was high-tech for 32. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really mechanical, very mechanical, and yeah, tape. <laughs> it, was, it was neat to watch. Kind of neat, part. but probably yeah. realistic at the time. They could do that. I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 It wasn't science fiction for 1932. No, it was really the technology they had. Yeah. 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 Meanwhile, the escaped convict, whose name is <clears throat> Quinn, meets up with a partner, and he shoots himself in the arm. Quinn runs towards Arnold's house, and his daughter likes him. She tends to his gunshot wound, mm. and he explains that Henderson told him to come there. Burke, Detective Burke, suspects that Henderson is going to be broken out next week, and he intends to follow up on that lead. Sure enough, Henderson gets out. Mm, sure enough, there he is. We don't see it. It happens off screen. Karloff on the loose. He just shows up on a suit at some point. His first step, Karloff's, is to visit Dr. Steiner who has all the usual mad scientist equipment. Bzz, 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 bzz. Mm -hmm. Henderson wants to know who the boss is and why he was set up to go to prison. Steiner tells him not to ask so many questions and that Henderson is going to soon take over Arnold's work. Henderson immediately recognizes that Burke is following him. Hmm. Steiner then x-rays Burke 
and he sees the badge. Steiner tells him to come back tomorrow. Steiner then tells Henderson to kill Burke before tomorrow comes. So Steiner is the head of this operation. As far as we know, there's a mysterious Mr. X who's actually in charge. Hmm. I wonder who that could be. Yeah. Hmm. Well, the police captain, or the FBI, or whatever it is, captain, wants Burke's report on who the mysterious Mr. X is. The man behind all the drug problems. The captain is interrupted in a meeting with a package containing Burke's badge. He's been killed. Oops. He sleeps with the fishes. Oops. Quinn is now working as Mr. Arnold's chauffeur, and he's also sweet on Arnold's daughter. Arnold, Quinn, and Henderson all meet up. Henderson explains that he's taking over Arnold's operation, and the Dr. Steiner wants to see you right away. Edwards and Henderson both work for the boss, and he wants Arnold out of the picture. Henderson explains Quinn's part in the drug operation. On the way out, Quinn passes Steiner coming in. Steiner recognizes him and explains to Henderson that Quinn is a secret service man. Uh-oh. They both come to the conclusion that Quinn is after their boss, the mysterious Mr. X. Hmm. As Quinn leaves to oversee the freighter, he's there to oversee the drug pickup, right. he warns Julie about her father. Arnold explains to her that Quinn's real name is Hart and that he's a spy. He's a spy. She tries to warn Hart, but she's too late. Quinn slash Hart does go out on a plane and picks up the drugs as ordered. He drops them off to Henderson and tells, who tells Quinn to fly out to sea, bail out, and he'll come pick him up. Yeah, honest we will. Of course, as soon as yeah. they see him bail out, they turn around and go the other way. Hmm. Hart explains later that he put a dummy in a parachute and he didn't really jump at all. Yeah, we see, we see the bailout. Yeah. Steiner goes to Arnold's house and Edwards lets him in. She says he's sleeping quietly. Very quietly. Hmm. Julie and Hart go to the hospital to see Arnold, who is being operated on as they arrive. Turns out, Dr. Steiner is doing the surgery with Edwards assisting, and surprisingly, Arnold doesn't survive. Murder. Yeah. Edward spots Hart and informs the boss, whom we still haven't seen, that Hart isn't really dead. Because he faked that whole bailout thing. Yeah, the Bureau finds the answering machine, and they know that Hart's been exposed to Mr. X, who is now actually Dr. Steiner. No. He was in charge all along. In disguise. Hart wants to dig up Arnold and do an autopsy on the body to prove Steiner killed him. Which they do. They like literally bring bring the casket into this guy's house who's an expert and, you know, yeah. at home. <laughs> well, his home, his home office. Here. Right? But, Peter, Doctor, we hate to interrupt you yeah. at home. Can you cut this guy yeah, Are open? you busy? Yeah, we need you to, we need you to look at see what killed this guy. <laughs> yeah. The cops all march out to the cemetery, dig up the body, and they find a huge load of drugs inside the coffin. Huh. Steiner slash Mr. X has been using the coffins as a way to draw, smuggle drugs. Which makes no sense whatsoever. They, they, they say at some point that this whole this whole cemetery is just full of drugs. Mm-hmm. Which Why? I guess they'll dig up later. Why? If it's you're smuggling thing. them, you should be like shipping them overseas or something like that. Yeah. Why bury them shipping in the ground in town and then have to dig them up later? What an extra lot of work. I don't know. He's hiding them. He's not necessarily well, smuggling them. Place. Smuggling yeah. implies movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the bad guys capture Julie and take her to the hospital to do an operation on her as well. Hart rushes over to save her, but he gets jumped from behind. He wakes up to see Dr. Steiner standing over him. The two have a long, I am going to kill you, no you won't, conversation. Buy in time until the good guys get there. Yeah. yeah. And Henderson has been captured, but he doesn't actually know who Mr. X is. He gets captured off screen. We don't ever see what happens to Boris Karloff. He was in the first half of the film pretty heavily, and then he just sort of goes and then away. he just went away and was never seen again. We never see what yeah. happens to mentioned, him. Mentioned off screen. Yeah, he was arrested somewhere. Yeah. Julie comes in and shoots Steiner dead. She then releases Hart, and they escape happily ever after. All right. Well, I realized halfway through this that Dr. Steiner was a stereotypical 1930s representation of Hollywood thought what Hollywood thought Jews looked like and is not a flattering representation, Mm-mm. since he's the head of the large criminal enterprise, after all. And he's played by Edward Van Sloan, best known for playing Dr. Van Helsing in the prior year's Dracula. And this was not his best work. No, no. 
Boris he was Karloff. better as Van Helsing. Yeah. yeah. He was really good as Van Helsing. Uh-huh. Boris Karloff is here without makeup, playing Henderson, a basic 1930s gangster. He's surprisingly young looking, and his accent is very different from his later roles. You can tell he had a voice coach. Mm-hmm. His little lisp isn't there. It's not even remotely a horror film, although they do have some medical equipment that goes buzz buzz a few times, and they eventually dig up a body in the cemetery. Yeah, we get to see a coffin, so therefore, you know, horror. The doctor's explanation of the surgery he's about to perform on Hart could be considered horror at the time as well. Sort of body horror. Maybe. Still, it's much more of a crime drama. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Karloff is kind of wasted here. So it was not too bad, but not a horror movie. I wouldn't even go so far as to say it wasn't too bad. It, it was pretty lame. Mm-hmm. Well, the mismatch of the sound didn't help. No. <laughs> See, I can look past these things. Yeah. So, we saw The Nanny. We too, did. From 1965. Hammer time. She's got Betty Davis eyes, you know. <laughs> Old, droopy, and wrinkly. <laughs> Well, it was 1965, after all. She was no longer a sweet young thing. Just once, I need to watch a <laughs> Betty Davis movie where she wasn't an old when woman. When she's, yeah, well, it looked for early stuff. Everybody says she used to be pretty. Lots I've of never early seen stuff. She was gorgeous. She looks like my yeah. grandma. Well, she's, yeah, and this, yeah. She was, <laughs> not, she was grandma age in this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, she was up there. How, 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 what year was she born? Betty Davis was born on April 5th, 1908. There you go. So, upper 50s. All right. Well, Betty Davis was in her upper 50s at this point. She really wasn't super grandma material. 53. But she not 53? didn't age well. I, I don't math. Born in ni- 65 <laughs> minus 57. 8. 57. 57, yes. She was 57. And she looked every day of it. Math is hard. But they could have had her aged up for with makeup, too. I don't think they did. They don't? I don't, I don't think she was supposed to be that old. Yeah. Anyway. Well, this one was directed by Seth Holt, written by Jimmy Sangster and Marianne Modell. Stars Betty Davis, Wendy Craig, and Jill Bennett. One hour, 33 minutes. And this is also Hammer's last black and white horror film. The last one they did. And it was more of a horror film than The Mask, certainly. Oh, yeah. Still, yeah, I think this qualifies. Still more of a... Oh, yeah. Today, Psycholo- I think it would be... Psychological, a, psychological thriller. Yeah, I think yeah. today it would be more of a psychological thriller, but mm-hmm. I think it was horror at the time. Yeah. That someone like that could be in charge of your children. Mm-hmm. Except that may not be the case. Yeah. Did you like it? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I thought it was... Mm-hmm. I thought it was, yeah, surprisingly good for what... Again, it's a psychology, you know, mm-hmm. crazy people thing in the 60s with Hammer, so... Eye roll time, but I can. But see, this was pretty well done, and I can see why Betty Davis was a big deal. Masterful acting. Yeah, well, yeah, she's very yeah, good. Yeah, she I thought everybody in this one was pretty good. Yeah, even yeah. the kid. Yeah, yeah, who never went Child on to actor. do much. He did um, Doctor Doolittle. Doolittle after this. Yes, and then and then in like forty years later, he was juror number part. twelve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know what the story is there, but he didn't go into it as a career, which is a shame. Cause, yeah. You know, he was very I good. thought the kid looked really familiar is why I looked him up, but no, he wasn't in much. No. No. Okay. So. Well, we start it. out with children playing on a, the most dangerous looking playground equipment I have ever seen. Yeah, it was a different time. Sure was. Yeah. Monkey bars that would kill real monkeys. Was that, that nasty. And that merry-go-round, they're just waiting to grind fingers and limbs and yeah. drag people to their death on the dirt below yeah it's fun yeah yeah well betty davis walks through the park feeding the birds everything is wholesome and wonderful as the credits roll she eventually arrives back home and we see that she's the nanny in a home where the parents are fighting about something inside the box she was carrying is a cake marked welcome home joey written on it are you going to tell about the cake <laughs> she's walking along. She's got the box on its side. She's doing, she gets some flowers and, you know, feeding the birds and doing all this stuff and just, you know, flopping the box all around and sideways and upside down. It's a cake. And she opens it up and it's it looks perfect. perfect. <laughs> it's a perfect cake. <laughs> I suspect most of the scenes had an empty box. <laughs> well, I would have had to. Yeah. It was that a, cake could it not have survived that the trip. cake. Yeah. But it, that was a trivia thing to, that we saw ahead of time to 
look for the look at the cake box and how she's handling that <laughs> <laughs> up until the time she gets home. <laughs> she's just flopping it every which way. Yeah, that was pretty funny. <laughs> well, the parents are going to pick up little Joey from the asylum where he's lived for two years. His mother doesn't want him to come home. Hmm. We flash back to when everyone was happy and there was a little girl living there, which sets the mother off crying again. The psychiatrist in charge of the asylum explains that Joey is definitely not all right. Joey scares the nurse by making it look like he'd hung himself. That was a good scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't, surprise, can't believe he didn't get in more trouble for that. Yeah. Yeah. He's mentally disturbed for sure, but they won't know how things will turn out until he's back at home for a while. The psychiatrist mm. explains that the boy has a destructive attitude toward middle-aged females. And as soon as he's gone from the asylum, the staff there are really glad he's gone. I guess he was a hellion. Man, I'm glad that kid's out of here. Yeah, smart and a troublemaker. And the psychiatrist agrees <laughs> with her. Yeah. Well, Joey very quickly makes it clear that he doesn't like the nanny. He explains that he knows how to make a hangman's knot, and he even unpacks a working noose from his bag. And I just knew that was going to show up later in something important. And, and for the longest time, way through the movie... Uh, Betty Davis is the nanny, you know, she's kind, professional, helpful, sweet, um, no indication that there's... It's very clear that this is a little psycho kid, and that's how it seems, unfairly being blamed. Yeah, that's very much how it seems, yeah. Well, I like the movie, because it's actually Mm kind of complicated. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Joey says he's a big boy now, and doesn't really need a nanny anymore. The father says, nope, she's part of the family now, and she has to stay to help her, his mother with the housework. Yeah, she's a house servant, too, not just... Because, well, all this time, Joey's been in the nut case, the nut house, and and the little girl doesn't seem to be there. So, yeah, you know, we like, don't know what's up with that Nanny's just kind of been more of a maid than a nanny. And she has, and she is nanny. She, we never hear her name. Well, that's true, yeah. Yeah, she's just nanny. <laughs> Well, Joey's Aunt Pen comes to visit, and it comes up that she has a bad heart. And, wow, that's a foreshadowing. <laughs> we saw that, like, oh, okay, we know, yeah, there, there, know how that's going to end for her. <laughs> there's a <laughs> lot of a... foreshadowing in various <laughs> things here. Yeah. <laughs> and I just knew that noose was going to come in useful, too. Well, I expected the man to get work. hung at Or at least the, the rope work. Yeah. I, knew, I knew he'd be using the rope the way he was exper- expert in knots. And, and the bad uh, heart thing is just shoehorned in there. Oh, that's, yeah, that's not that even that smooth. So much, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Penn agrees with Joey that they should get rid of the nanny as well. There's a lot of drama as Joey fights with pretty much everybody, and his mother just won't stop crying. Yeah, she's she's awfully weepy in this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a fight about Joey not wanting the nanny to come into the bathroom while he's having a bath, which is far dr- for more dramatic than it needs to be, since it's a simple request. Mm-hmm. Hey, can you tell her not to come into the bathroom when I'm in there naked? How is that an unreasonable thing? Because he's a little boy, and it's 1965 England, and she's the nanny, and, you know, and she's... Nowadays, it would go the other way. He should get in trouble for going in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, well. It was a different time. All the while, the nanny makes one excuse after another for the child, all trying to reduce tension, as a good nanny should. Mm-hmm. She's very good at her job. Yeah. But Joey meets the girl upstairs, whose name is Bobby, and they talk about kid stuff. Yeah, there's a fire escape outside mm-hmm. that connects the apartments, basically. Then, he, you know, yeah, the kids go out on the balcony and you know, on, on the fire escape and up and down to the each other's apartments. Throw flower boxes at delivery men and things. Yeah, yeah, he did that. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. tried to kill me. Yeah. Well, Joey tells her that his sister died and he got blamed for it. Joey accuses the nanny of trying to poison him, and his and her reaction is not what you'd expect. Hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For a long yeah. while, the nanny looks like mm-hmm. the reasonable one, and Joey looks like a little psychopath. Could it be, though, that that's not the whole story? Maybe. Maybe this nanny isn't actually Mary Poppins. Well, she doesn't have magical abilities. She can't fly or anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing leads to that another. That we know of. That we know of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. One thing leads to another, and soon enough, the nanny and little Joey have their inevitable showdown. No more spoilers. No more spoilers. But it, this was a good one. I, I would recommend checking this I one I thought this out. was a good one, too. Yeah. Little yeah. Joey knows how to push at people's buttons, for sure. He's a master manipulator, definitely. Mm-hmm. Just under an hour in, we start to get a pretty good idea of what's going on, but it's not really clear until then. And then, even then, it's not totally right. clear. 
Yeah. Eventually, the whole story comes out about what happened two years ago, and it's still not exactly what you'd predict. Mm -hmm. The nanny has her version of the story, and so does Joey. Unlike the villains in most horror... Villains with an S. In most Mm -hmm. horror films, everyone here has a story, and they're all more or less sympathetic. Mm -hmm. That said, the ending is surprisingly weak. What happened at the very end? Yeah. We don't know. That would I I would say that it's its biggest fault, the mm-hmm. ending. Like, yeah. Well, that's it. Everybody knows <laughs> the truth, but we do not see justice. No, not really. Yeah. They kind of... Yeah. But, yeah. but anyway, check it out. It's worth it. Yeah, it was it's good. good. Yeah. 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 Black and white, but all right. That's all right. I forgive them for that. Black and white, it's all right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which takes us to our indie film this week called Clown Fear from 2020. It's a new one. came out in, I think, February. Directed by Min Collins, written by Min Collins and Sadie Katz, stars Elissa Dowling, Sadie Katz, and Randy Wayne. Runtime, one hour, 49 minutes. Do I want to ask you what you thought of this? There were things I liked about it. It, 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 it had ended eventually. It had some, some likable things. <laughs> wow. I'll just sit over here. For this. <laughs> Not his favorite movie. All right, he's going to leave it to me to tear this up. Well, well I'll, I'll defend it as best I can. <laughs> it was okay. in color. It was in color. <laughs> It had sound, it had no sound, subtitles. It had, the end was cool. It had good makeup. Some of the characters were fun. Like, you know. <laughs> it's like pulling teeth to get you to slam a movie. Yeah. <laughs> well, we begin with a few clowns in a smoky room. They have a fan tied up on a chair. The the person kind of not like, yeah. the, not like the world. A girl clown. from the circus. Why does he have to bring those whores back here, yells the clown's girlfriend. Joey, the other clown, has his daughter come into the room while the first clown beats the girl to death with a hammer. And credits roll. And right away, you know, these aren't the necessarily funny kind of clowns. Are there funny clowns? These are the deadly kind of clowns. Scary clowns. Yeah, kind of. Okay, we fast forward ten years later to Clown City, USA. Literally, that's Mm -hmm. what it's called. Yeah. And ten years later, Mm -hmm. a woman has a car accident and flips her car over, but she's more upset about getting wet in the rain than the car accident. Fortunately, she's crashed right in front of the Clown Inn in Clown City. Just a wee walk. And then she acts surprised that the place is creepy. (laughs) That said, the place is really creepy. But a cool kind of creepy. I'd I'd like to stay at an inn like that. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) The entire decor is... Is clowns wall very, to very, wall circus very stuff. fun housey and circusy yeah, yeah yeah even the spigot in the in the tub is a clown and the little clown reaching out yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I like that yeah the, I, I don't the, I I assume this is probably a real place because I I get the feeling this film didn't have enough money to make that set that would have taken a, a lot lot to put together yeah so, so that, yeah. probably a real thing or somebody's real collection or something yeah. Well, she decides to get naked and take a shower, but then when she gets out, she's followed by a clown midget. She kicks him in the nuts, but then finds out that an even bigger clown is behind her, who stabs a knife right through her head. And the gore was pretty good. We changed scenes. Gore was realistic. To a bride named Carly on her wedding day. They're getting married at a place that has a drive through window. <laughs> the priest there is really funny. She's marrying a guy named Tommy, who's clearly too smarmy to even sell cars. The smarmy dude turns out to be the classy half of the duo, as he finds certain text messages on her phone. Tommy dumps her in the middle of the ceremony. Carly and her three bridesmaids drive off. Turns out Carly wasn't really having an affair. She was playing with her female stripper. Tommy figures this out and decides to follow Carly to get her back. Carly and the girls get lost in the desert on a perfectly straight road with no detours, and they break down in front of the Clown Inn. What a coincidence. We have more guests. Of all the motels in all the world, we just happen to break down in front of the Clown Inn 
says one of the girls. Hmm. Dialogue. Mm -hmm. It's what's happening. (laughs) Tommy and his friend Miles run across a clown with a bunny in the middle of the road at night. The clown rips the rabbit's head off in front of them. And then he does the same to Miles as Tommy runs off. And again, good realistic gore. Yeah. Good special effects. Meanwhile, the girls check into the clown inn, and then their problems really start. Yeah. Hilarity ensues from there. Yeah. And the whole town is all clowns, and they've got like... Clown Clown City, USA? They're worshiping a clown god, and, you know, making sacrifices to the clown god, and, you know, it gets a little complicated. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. Lots of people in clown makeup. Well, my number one complaint about this movie... Yep, mine too. ...was the sound. The sound. Oh, was it was it horrible. Do you think it could have just been our copy, the screener copy? That, or was it? It was streaming. I mean, it, it no, I think we were watching on Amazon Prime. The, the screener didn't work. Oh, that's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is yeah. Amazon Prime we're talking about. This isn't a bad copy. Well, the, the sound, sound... The sound wasn't good, especially at the beginning. It got better. No, no, it really didn't. I, I, well, I, I'll wait. get to the details. Okay. The no. sound, at least in the first several scenes, sounds like it was recorded over a radio or something. Their voices were, like, hissy, monotone, like it came off a radio. It didn't sound right. Really bad sound, and we had to scan forward to make sure we even wanted to sit through it in the beginning. If it hadn't cleared up in later scenes, we would not have even finished it. It mm-hmm. was really bad. Uh, but it does clear up mostly later in the film, but it never really gets good with the sound. Later on, I realized that most of the noise was not an audio distortion. It was supposed to be the soundtrack of the film, but it only sounded like audio distortion, even when it was covering up the dialogue. Literally, the soundtrack was okay. through most of the film. Okay, you're exaggerating. That. No, I think <laughs> that was music. I think that was instrumental noise. I think that was supposed to be like that. I don't think that was static. Okay. Hmm. Drop us a note. Listen to yeah. listen to watch the movie. You tell me. Is that music or is it just the worst sound ever? Well, the acting isn't terrible. The camera work is not bad. The sets and the scenery are really good. The clown in itself is a fascinating setting and it's definitely creepy. So is the town. And I have to wonder oh. if it's a real place somewhere. The story itself is just fine, but it's a little thin at points. Uh, There's something explained about the motel being built over some kind of cemetery, and there have always been evil clowns there, even since cowboy days or something. If you ever break the the code of the clown, you die a painful death, we're told, and it's kind of like some weird religion. Mm -hmm, It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the story meanders to the clown trial, which is really kind of a fun scene. After all, who can resist a dunk tank full of acid? Mm. On the downside, there was a lot of slow dragging scenes to get there. There's a lot going on here that makes no sense, but the one bright thing to say is that I didn't hate this quite as much as Kevin did. Blame it on me. He had a lot more words for me after this than he's telling you now. (laughs) Not gonna be not gonna be a critic. I'm a reviewer. I'll give it a f- four out of ten. I will too. <laughs> so there. Would you rather watch this again or Suspiria again? You gave Suspiria a zero or a one. <laughs> Ratings are all relative. <laughs> He's not gonna say it. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Later this afternoon, he's going to break and say, I admit it! I hated it! But I won't get that on film. Not going to admit it. (sighs) Then we had another uh, uh, indie film come in called Omnivores from 2013. This one I liked the most of all the movies. I don't know how indie this was. It's a foreign language subtitled film. But the production values are very good. Mm -hmm. I suspect this was some overseas studio Mm -hmm. that an indie place over here is doing the distribution for. It worked, though. Because this looked like a big studio movie. Spanish with subtitles. Yeah. Um, And it's Omnivoros is the original. Renamed Omnivores here. Mm -hmm. Directed by Oscar Rojo. Written by him also. Stars stars Angel Acero, Fernando Albizu, and Karina Bjorn. Runtime, hour and 27 link in the show notes to go to Amazon and pick it up. So, you say you liked this one. Yeah, I did. I did too. Yeah, I liked it quite a lot. Yeah, I give this Mm -hmm. a definite 8. 
This yeah. was really good. Yeah, I would too. I mean, not not awesomely best, but, but, but the best, solidly good. The best of all these, and solidly good, and yeah, the yeah, mm-hmm. uh, best thing yeah. I saw this week. Yeah. Okay, so a dying woman in the past somewhere tells her son Demos to run to town and get her help, but she's dead before he even gets up off the floor. He says he's starving. Hmm. Well, good thing there's something to eat now, eh? <laughs> Sometimes mm. late. Sometime later. A man shows up at the cabin with food for them, and he finds that Demas has eaten half the dead mother. The man then buries the woman's remains, and credits roll. Hmm. Years later, Demas is a grown man who has organized a big dinner. He goes back into the kitchen and talks to the chef, who we see is carving up human meat. And this was definitely a horror movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The editor for a food magazine hires Marcos, a food critic, to check out a special kind of restaurant, one that makes special dishes. She gets him an invitation to one of these parties. Yeah, he's into um, clandestine restaurants that aren't mainstream, very, very discreet, low-key. Sometimes they serve illegal stuff. Or High-end endangered, invitation Endangered only. animals and things like that. You know, where, you know, you have to... What be, was the donation... Uh, thousand dollars or something to get into the first one i think so yeah, yeah ten thousand later yeah yeah okay so we see the chef smack a girl over the head with a meat tenderizer and then throw her in the back of his van marcos arrives at the party and there's some normal sounding dinner conversation after dinner he has sex with one of the other guests and tells her his review of the dinner then she offers to take him to more of these clandestine dinners and this was one of, this was uh fugal Fugu. Fugu, yeah, yes. They were lots of fugu dishes, the poisonous fish that'll, if it's not prepared right and you get too much of the wrong stuff, it can kill you. And Which I don't know how, so, how popular, how but, many people know about. I learned about it from one of those old Columbo movies back in the 70s. And I don't think it's illegal or, you know, I don't know why this was so clandestine. Well, like you said in the movie, there are only a few chefs that are authorized to make it. Yes, it is Maybe it is limited. illegal. Or it is I very don't limited, know. yeah. You wouldn't want just anybody fixing it. No, you would not. Yeah. Well, we also see Dima, Demas and the angry chef capturing and tormenting another prisoner, apparently fattening him up for a future meal. Uh, soon after, Marcus's friend Carla says she knows of a clandestine restaurant that serves human flesh... And Marcos is definitely interested. As is his employer. And, yeah. You know, hey, we can make a lot of money off writing about this. And, <laughs> yeah. Once he arrives, it's explained that no one leaves without trying the meat. Because that dun, way dun. you're an accessory. Yeah, you're in on once, it. Once you're in, you're in. And they want to make sure that you're in once you... Yeah. yeah. And then stuff happens from there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then it gets weird and complicated. And, it yeah, does. It was overall very good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, this is really well shot, and every scene is colorful and interesting. The food discussions alone are actually interesting, mm-hmm. and I think the dinner scenes were some of the more interesting scenes in the film. Yeah, talking about what they were preparing and what they were fixing, and, you know, before, before the, you know, human meat ones, they, you know, yeah. the, the other, you know, the weird restaurants that he went to, you know, small private restaurants that he went to. Yeah. yeah. And I like that Marcos isn't even undercover. He tells exactly every, he tells everyone exactly who he is. Oh yeah, and he signs I'm up writing for a this book and, on this topic. Yeah, and they know who he is when he But the cannibals through. let him in anyway. Well, they have a lot of lot of steps you have to go through to make it there and you know. Yeah. Yeah. They were he okay still could have it. written his articles and named names and stuff, and then what would have happened? You ever see Hostel? Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hadn't expected what finally happened at the end, but in retrospect, it all worked out really well. Mm-hmm. If you're looking for a really well done cannibal meal, <laughs> see what he cannibal there. film with see a touch of there. with a touch of class, <laughs> this is a really tasty film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. yeah. And then back in December, uh, de- December 24th, we reviewed the, the butcher, butcher from 2020, where they were serving human meat. A much lower budget indie film. Mm-hmm. I think. The, the butcher guys must have seen this at some point because this Maybe. movie's a couple years old. Yeah, there were some scenes that really look right from that. Maybe, so, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think one, there was definitely influence there, if not a straight rip off. But I liked both actually. I liked the yeah. butcher. Yeah, so did Omnivores I. was better, but I liked the butcher too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see both if you get a chance. Yeah, compare them. See which. Yeah. tell us what you guys think.
So, you see any shorts this week? No. No. <laughs> we, we kind of <laughs> we forgot, forgot the we short. Forgot to see a short. Oops. Check horrorguys.com. We will watch a short and get a review on there for you. Yeah. Not in the show, though. Yeah. But on the other hand, that mm-hmm. is our show for the week. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Stop in during the week at horrorguys.com for news and horror updates, to comment on the podcast, or to read that missing short review. <laughs> get ready for next week when we'll be watching some more classics. We'll begin with the really old Night of Terror from 1933. Bela Lugosi returns. Mm-hmm. And then open the casket on Dracula, Prince of Darkness from 1966, as well as two more indie films, Agramon's Gate and Theater of Terror, from both from 2019. I haven't seen any of these yet. Um, I think we probably have both seen Dracula, Prince of Darkness, would be my guess. You think? It's a hammer. Chances are over the years I have. Probably. When I was a wee lad. Yeah, not could, recently, though. Could be one of those I barely remember because I saw when I was you know, five. Don't yeah, one of those Saturday nights, stay up and watch it on the, the horror show. Yeah. And that's our show. Yeah. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.